But Titus chapter 2, verse 11, the Bible says, For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Titus concludes with these thoughts, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. This block of five verses are among some of my favorite in all the Bible. You probably heard that phrase uh, ad nauseum over the last several years. But it truly is. It's a, it's a great block of verses that have a lot of, uh, a lot of doctrinal implications uh, many of which we're not going to be able to cover all this morning because you'd be here longer than you probably are bargaining for. Uh, but there's enough here to chew on. In fact, uh, there is enough doctrine in these five verses to drown the greatest theologian. But yet these five verses are shallow enough that even a baby Christian could comprehend them. It, aren't you glad that the Bible is written for both the scholar as well as for the layman? I mean, uh, 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 the common, born-again, Bible-believing Christian can pick up the book and get something really good out of it. And this morning, I want to give you some brief thoughts on five very powerful verses in the Word of God. Brief thoughts on Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity this morning. That is ours to be in your presence. Thank you, Father, for your goodness to us, Lord. Father, thank you for the change in weather. Uh, Lord, it's not raining necessarily, Lord, but it's uh, definitely a, a change. Father, we went from 90 degrees a few days ago to uh, down to a low of in the 30s, Lord, in some places. And uh, Lord, it's a, an interesting change. And I thank you, Father, for it, Lord. It allowed me to work yesterday in, in some cool weather. Appreciate that. Father, I pray this morning that, Lord, you'd be with the, 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 the folks that are, that are gone today, Lord. We pray for Bob and Vicki as they're up in Northern Cal, and some families are out towards San Diego, and a few others, Lord, here and there. And, Lord, we just pray for uh, Frank's up in uh, Vegas, Lord, working. And, Father, we just pray that you would be with these individuals, Lord, who are out and about, Lord, for those that are still ill. We pray, Father, you'd heal their bodies quickly. Lord, looking forward to what you have to show us today from this passage, Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for being good. Father, we cannot thank you enough for just being a great God. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. I want to start at verse number 11. I really wanted to preach all of Titus, but again, <laughs> you don't have time for that either. But, but these five verses are wonderful, and, and there are a lot of great verses in the book of Titus. In fact, uh, the book of Titus ends what is known as the pastoral epistles, okay? And, and I don't know why they're named that, other than the fact that uh, 1 Timothy and Titus have the qualifications for the pastors and also qualifications for the deacons. So I guess they could be called the deacon epistles, but they're not that either. But in Bible college, they called them the pastoral epistles. And uh, you have Paul writing to a pastor uh, here, Titus, and of course, also to Timothy. Uh, but nevertheless, you've got these qualifications in here. But right here towards kind of the end of the book of Titus, or at least coming to the end of the book of Titus, you've got these five verses that I have heard preached by many preachers some messages weren't, list, weren't, weren't worth listening to, and some messages were pretty worth listening to. I don't know how today's message is going to go. You can tell me after the service today whether this was worth listening to. That was not our, I don't think that's our girl. No, that would be Jesse being slowly tortured. But anyway, verse number 11, verse number 11 the Bible says this, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. Now, if you're an all men, say amen. amen. I am glad that God's grace is not selective. Let me say it this way. I'm glad that God's grace is not elective. Amen. God's grace hath appeared unto all men. Now, the, here's the, the heart-wrenching truth behind that phrase. 
though it has appeared unto all men, not all men will embrace it. I preached a few weeks ago, I think it was Resurrection Sunday, so that was April 16th. I said that the blood was made applicable to both thieves on the cross, but only one thief received him. But the thief that was casting aspersions to Christ and saying all kinds of things while he was there hanging on the very same cross, uh, the blood was applied for that man, but he went to hell. And I'm saying to you that God's grace hath appeared unto all men. And that grace brings salvation. It's not to some men, it's not just to the elect, but it has appeared unto all men. I want you to also notice in that verse how the grace of God in verse 11 is personified in verse 13. Notice there, verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared. Look up here. Grace has appeared. If you're looking at Christ, you're looking at grace. Notice verse 13. Looking. What are we looking for? An appearance. Catch it? We're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I want that to happen like before the service ends. That would be great, because then you won't have to judge me as to whether or not these five verses were good and whether they were preached well. But the fact is, we're looking for something. We're looking for the grace of God, not that bringeth salvation, that already is present, but we are looking for something else. And may I say that I hope it's a lot sooner than later. Paul calls it his blessed hope. He calls it the believer's blessed hope. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, you don't need to turn there. But, now, uh, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The Bible says this in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 8. He says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. We're looking for an appearing. We're looking for a day when the grace of God is personified in a person where now our faith is not just in something we can't see, but faith has been made sight. The first thing I want you to notice there in verse 11 of Titus is the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Then drop down to verse 12. Notice that this grace that is given you through salvation teaches you some things. It teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now that grace that appeared, and more specifically to those who received it by faith, hopefully that's everybody in this room this morning, teaches the believer several things. Number one, it teaches you that you ought to deny ungodliness. It teaches you that you ought to deny ungodliness. You say, what is the notion of ungodliness? Well, not that that word needs much defining, because we live in a world that is basically ungodly. Uh, with all kinds of ungodly ideas. And the word ungodly is used throughout the Word of God in various contexts, but in, in most places, it's pretty self-defining. But the word ungodliness carries with it the idea of acting without reference to God at all. Let me say that again. The word ungodliness carries with it the idea of acting without reference to God. If you will, a lack of God reference in one's thoughts, a lack of God reference in one's conversation, and a lack of God reference in one's daily conduct. Now is it possible that even a believer could live in a way that would deny a God reference in their life? I say yes. In fact, I've been around some of you when you've done it. In fact, you might have been around me when you've done it. But the fact is, folks, it is very possible that we can live 
without reference to God in our thoughts, in our conversation, and in our conduct daily. And you know, what's funny is we think that only because someone sees us, therefore we have to manifest that to someone who sees us. Do you know that God sees you all the time? And how you act in the car, alone, on SoCal freeways, is more indicative of ungodliness than most of you actually think. Say amen. Don't sit there like a bunch of Episcopalians waiting for someone to preach. It's true. Now you say, preacher, are you guilty? Number one. Number one. I got to drive to Pomona tomorrow for graduation. I got to be at a board meeting at 1130, but I got to leave the valley at 8. Yeah, someone gave me a courtesy laugh over there. That's good. Yeah, yeah, I, I wish it was you doing this. But uh, nevertheless, I got to try to get to Pomona, Laverne technically, uh, by uh, 11 o'clock tomorrow morning for an 1130 board meeting. And I'm hoping that when I enter that board meeting with seven other pastors who I know are godly men, who are not going through the same trials and tribulations I'll be going through tomorrow, I'm sure they'll be ready to deal with the issues at hand of the college in a godly manner, in all manner of conversation. Listen, if you have been born again, you have a grace that God has given you, and that grace begins to tell you things that you need to start taking out of your life. And the one thing it says is you need to deny ungodliness. Now you say, what, what, what does deny mean, preacher? It means don't give it any life. Deny it. I got some plants in my backyard. If I deny them water, they cease to grow. I got a dog in my house. If I deny it water and food, it ceases to live. If I deny this body the basic necessities of food and water, I die. What am I saying? The grace of God tells you to starve ungodliness. Your problem is you give it just enough food to keep it alive. Just in case you get bored of being godly. Amen, 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 preacher. That's good Presbyterian preaching. You get bored of being godly. You know why? Because it's a little more fun to be ungodly. So you keep that ungodliness on life support just in case you need it. But if the grace of God has access in your heart like it's supposed to, the first thing you'll do is deny it. Deny ungodliness. The second thing, worldly lusts. You ought to deny worldly lusts. You say, that's pretty self-explanatory. You're right, it is. It basically means the world, the flesh, and the devil, all the things that animate it. If you will, listen closely, if you will, Christian, stop making it about down here. Now, I know we live down here. I know that we have family down here. I know that we've got all this, everything's all wrapped up down here. But the Lord Jesus Christ told us in Matthew, he says, listen, don't lay up where moth and rust corrupt. He says, lay up, store treasures in heaven. Paul said this in the book of Colossians. He says, let your affections be placed on things above, not on things of this earth. Bible says also, if a man loved this world, he's an enemy of God. Now that doesn't mean you can't love the Grand Canyon, you can't love going to places. That means you can't love going fishing and, and hiking and all that stuff. That's not what it's talking about. But when those things have you, now we got an issue. The Lord will never give me a fifth wheel. The Lord will never give me a speedboat. Not that I want one. How do you fish in one of those? But anyway, I guess you could. Well, you wouldn't want all the guts on it. But anyway, I, the Lord will never give me certain things. Why? I'll abuse them. You know why the Lord won't give you certain things? Because He knows what you'll do with them. And if He does let you have those certain things, even, even when He knows what you'll do with them, maybe He's given up on you. Listen. Those are two things, worldly lusts and ungodliness, that the believer ought to deny their flesh every day. 
But you just can't deny the flesh some things without replacing it with something else. I think half the problem with fundamental Baptist preaching, or any Baptist preaching, is we tell you, deny this, deny this, deny this, deny this, deny this, deny this, don't go there, don't listen to that, don't hang out with those folks. So once you do all that, you got to, what are you going to do? Twiddle your thumbs? You'll notice in God's Word that God never tells you to deny something without replacing with something. Amen, amen. Because God knows what kind of creature you are. you got to do something. you got to get busy. But there are two things you ought to deny. Deny ungodliness and deny worldly lusts. And here are some things you ought to replace them with. You ought to live soberly, righteously, and you ought to live godly, in this present world. You say, what does that word soberly mean? It means to live sensibly and temperately. To live sensibly and temperately. Righteously, I think that's pretty uh, self-explanatory. Godly, the idea that God is in and working through your thoughts, your conversations, and conduct. The opposite of ungodliness. And he says the last thing you ought to be doing is to look for the blessed hope. And his glory appearing, that is, look for him who can take you out of this mess. Isn't that what you're in? Look what it says. Look at verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Thoughts not done, semicolon. Looking for. What is he saying? Don't keep your eyes down here in this horizontal mambo. Once our eyes are here, then we do the exact things about denying. We need to keep our gaze up here. You say, well, if I keep looking up, I won't be of any earthly good. Well, you shouldn't be of any earthly good anyway. <laughs> but you've got to keep looking. You say, why? Because your salvation cometh from above, not from down here. Looking for that blessed hope and His glorious appearing. Now, when do we do these things, preacher? When do we live soberly? When do we live godly? When do we live righteously? When do we look in this present world? Right now. You see, listen to me. I want you to listen to this closely because there's actually a deeper thought here than you realize. This Bible that you have in your lap or in your iPhone or on your iPad or whatever you're using today for a Bible, the Bible is not limited to the world that Titus lived in. When it says, in this present world, it is a reference to the world that any reader of Titus 2.12 is looking at in any age. <clears throat> it meant what Titus was dealing with at his time, and it meant from any believer from the last 2,000 years till today. When, when, when Spurgeon picked this Bible up in the 1800s, he meant, it meant he just ought to live soberly, righteously, and godly right then. Uh, when, 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 when John Huss picked this Bible up in the 12 and 1300s, he was supposed to live soberly and righteously and godly in that present world. Uh, when any believer in 100 A.D. or 200 A.D. or 300 A.D. picked up this Bible, he was supposed to live soberly and righteously in this present world. It is now May 2017, and nothing's changed about that admonition. You're supposed to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, looking for something that'll take you out of this mess. Listen, Christian, if you fail to take this, this biblical admonition to deny ungodliness and deny worldly lusts, and replace those two things with living soberly, righteously, and godly, and looking for that blessed hope, then the same world that you're supposed to deny will rob you of the affections that you're supposed to give God. <coughs> Can I say something to you? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Here's what happens when you don't deny ungodliness and deny worldly lusts. Verse 10. Everyone there? 2 Timothy 4.10. Everyone there? Say amen. amen. 
Look at verse 10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this what? So you don't think that applies now? <laughs> you say, oh, that was only the present world for Demas. No, that's right now. If you don't deny your flesh the worldly lust of this world and ungodliness, that same world will suck you in. I don't know much about Demas other than he's mentioned here in a couple of the times in Paul's writings. Evidently, Demas was one of the men that went with Paul in some of his missionary journeys. Maybe it was a blessing to him in some way. But here Demas is said to have forsaken me, that is Paul, having loved this present world. Wow, what a thing. Thank you. Evidently, me and Pastor Dan are having issues with our throats today. We're going to switch to filter tips. That's what we need to do, brother. All right. But seriously, Demas got sucked into this present world. Look up here. Do you know how easy it is, folks? You know what I'm looking at? I'm looking at a bunch of suckers that can easily be sucked into something. And we'll get in this church and we'll say amen to things, and then we'll get out there and get suckered into it. I'm talking about present company included. <laughs> Don't think that I'm the only righteous one here. I'm not no righteous guy. I mean, I got the righteousness of Christ, but that's a foreign righteousness, not my own. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I can get just as suckered in and snickered into all this stuff as you can. Why? Because we keep that thing on life support. Just in case God doesn't come through on something. I got this on the back burner, and we'll give ungodliness and worldly lust a, a try. Oh, I know you folks would never do that. Good godly people that you are. <laughs> Go back to Titus, if you would. Verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now... I want to do a little teaching here. Some of you like my teaching more than preaching, or maybe my preaching and my teaching. But verse 13 has an interesting statement in it that some people have taken issue with, and I'm going to correct it for you today because, well, I don't correct the Bible, but I correct those who correct it. I love correcting people who think they're smarter than the book because the book will make them look like absolute fools, especially with a right handler of it. Verse 13 looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, isn't that weird? The phrase of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, has been attacked by the detractors of the King James to give you the impression that the King James translators had unwittingly separated Jesus from God, thus denying Christ's deity. Let's read that again. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God, whom they would say is Jehovah, and our Savior Jesus Christ, making the distinction between the two. Now, I remember what, years ago when I was debating a Jehovah's Witness, who, of course, they denied Jesus Christ as God, they pointed to verse 13 of Titus chapter 2, among other verses, and said, there it is right there, verse 13. The Apostle Paul says, the great God, that would be Jehovah God, that's whom we worship. That's who the Jehovah's Witnesses say, we worship Him. And our Savior Jesus Christ, there, see, notice, see, Jehovah God, and then the Savior. So we have God, and then Jesus. Now, all that's nonsense, of course. You say, then what's going on here, preacher, in verse 13? I mean, really, what's going on with your King James Bible, preacher? What we have here is something that the smart people can't figure out. But yet they went to school to figure this stuff out. We have a figure of speech in verse 13 called a handiady or a handiady. H-E-N-D-I-A-D-Y. A handiady or a handiady. Depending on which part of the country you're from, you'll pronounce it one of those two ways. You say, what's a handiady, preacher? It means one by means of two. One by means of two. I'll give an example of that in the Bible. Examples of this figure of speech are all over the place, and yet, yet, in these other places, the translators of these newer translations will not 
make mention of it, but right here, boy, there's a problem. Look at James chapter 127. Let's do a little Bible study real quick. You all right with that? James 127. Let's look at it. James 127. James 127. James 127. Everyone there say amen. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father. What, God and the Father aren't the same? God and Father. God and the Father. Look up here. One by means of two. One by means of two. Let me give you another example of that. Look at Acts chapter 3, verse 14. You've got to see them. Don't trust me, man. Be a Berean about your Bible. Acts chapter 3, verse 14. Acts chapter 3, verse 14. The context is Peter talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. You can catch that in verse 13. But verse 14 says, But ye denied the Holy One and the just. What, is he holy but not just? Look up here. Is he holy but not just, or is he the Holy One and the just? One by means of two. One by means of two. Let me give you another one. Go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. These things are all over the Bible. It's amazing how they just pick apart one. Ephesians chapter 5. By the way, they're in the New Translations too. They're all over. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. What, they're two different kingdoms? Same kingdom. Right? One by means of two. Listen, listen to me. The first word expresses the thing, while the second word or phrase intensifies the description with another word describing the same thing. That's all you've got there. Look, uh, I'll give you the, the, the maximum example of this. Go to Matthew 21, verse 5. Matthew 21, verse 5. It's amazing how these guys got an education. They can't figure out a figure of speech. Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, verse number 5. Keep your finger in Zechariah chapter 9, because that's where the prophecy came from. Zechariah chapter 9. So have your finger in Zechariah 21, verse 5. Another finger in Zechariah chapter 9. And another finger here, and another finger... I'm just kidding. Zechariah 9. Zechariah 9. And, but look at 21, Matthew 21, verse 5 first. Everyone there? Say amen. Let's look at verse 4. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. What? Did Jesus Christ ride two animals? Go back to Zechariah 9. Zechariah 9, verse 9. That's where, that's where Matthew got it from. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Look up here. Was Jesus riding on a donkey, or was he straddling him? It's a handiety, or a handiety. It's one by means of two. I'll give you one more. You say, why? Just to put these guys to bed. Numbers chapter 24. Listen, when these guys want to play, when they want to play theologian, they need to take the sand out of their hands, amen? Look at Numbers chapter 24. Numbers chapter 24. Nothing like a Bible to clear up education, say amen. Numbers chapter 24, verse 5. Numbers chapter 24, verse 5. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. Same person. Jacob was the guy that wrestled with God, whose name was changed to... He just called him by his first name and called him by the name he gave him after he wrestled with him. Same person. Now, there's other things going on in that passage, too, but it's a figure of speech. Now, get back over to Titus chapter, th uh, cha Titus chapter 2, and now let's look at it. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know what I read? The great God is our Savior. It's a figure of speech. He's our great God and our Savior. You say, how do I know that? Because the rest of the Bible supports it. Now, what's funny, <laughs> I'm 
I'm going to give you something for fun. Go to Psalms 119 real quick. I remember one time in Bible college, one of these smart guys was correct in the book. And I said, uh, and they came up to me. Of course, I was sitting there just kind of nodding my head. And uh, this particular gentleman, he's home to be with the Lord already. He's gone home to be with the Lord. He looked down at me and says, uh, Mr. Cook. Now, then I had glasses and I wore suspenders. I want you to picture that. I wore glasses and I had suspenders on. But my, but my suspenders always matched my tie. Oh, yeah. And they weren't the suspenders that... I would never wear a belt with suspenders because that's ridiculous. If you're going to wear suspenders, there's no need to wear a belt. So these suspenders were the ones that buttoned down on, under your pant, pants right here, not the ones that strapped onto your pants because real suspenders do the, what I just described. And so this... Uh, you're probably wearing something else today. But anyway, this, this brother said to me, Mr. Cook, I understand you're having trouble with what I'm saying. I says, I do. I've got problems with what you're saying. Yes, I do, sir. He says, what's your problem? He says, I said, it's very clear. What you have is a figure of speech. Are you saying that you know more than your professor, Mr. Cook? I gave him Psalms 119, verse 99. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. I gave them those verses. Now you say, why? Because they're there. Now I want you to look at the verses again. I wasn't being smart, even though there was a little bit of it, trust me. The Psalms 119, verse 99 and verse 100. I have more understanding than all my teachers for thy testimonies. You say, what are, what are God's testimonies? His words. You know what he's saying? Anybody that trusts in my words will have more understanding than the guy's teaching you. And if the guy teaching you doesn't have the same respect for the word that you've got, you can say, I've got more understanding than you. Verse number 100. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. What are precepts? His words. Now I'm going to tell you something right now, and you can either like it or lump it. God will show a man in, in the Bible something that he won't show another man because the guy that believes it for what it says, God will show him more. You know why that professor didn't see the hand deity? Because he didn't want to see it. He wanted to give me the impression that my $2,000 a semester was going to something. I thought I went to a Bible college to learn about the Bible. Because I was under the impression I had a perfect Bible. And so I thought my Bible professors were going to pick up their Bible and tell me something about the Bible that's true. Not sit there and criticize it. They say, that's a nitpicky thing. No, it's a big thing with me. Huge. Way up there with a fundamental of the faith. I got no problem with someone disagreeing with me on some things. Not everyone's going to not everyone's going to believe me on eschatology. Not everyone's going to believe me about whether Jesus Christ died on a Friday or a Wednesday. Not everyone's going to believe me about various things. But there's one thing you better believe. You better believe that book you've got is perfect. You mess with a book, I mess with you. And I don't care who you are. I don't care if you've got 1,000 people in your congregation or 10,000 people in your congregation or your professor so-and-so that has the respect of all these people. Unless you respect the word, you don't have mine. Go back to Titus chapter 2. I'm done now with that one. Let's go to verse 14. Verse 14, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. <laughs> these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Now I want you to notice verse 14. It's interesting. Now the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, which is going to happen. That's not a present reality yet. In one sense it is, but in another sense it isn't. And he's 
redeemed us to purify unto himself a peculiar people. Peculiar. Now, you have been bought back from the chopping block by God in order to be identified with him as a peculiar people. Synonyms of that word peculiar would be misfit, oddball, weird, objects of curiosity. These are truths, according to Paul, that I need to speak, exhort, and rebuke, especially if you're not doing them, and I'm supposed to do it with all authority, and let no man despise me for doing it. Now I want you to look at that verse again. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. You say, well, I'm not a misfit. Then you're missing the point. You say, I'm not an oddball. Then you're missing the point. You say, I'm not weird. Then you're missing the point. You say, I'm not an object of curiosity. Then you're missing the point. You were bought back from the chopping block to be different than when you were not bought. Now let's get more practical. Do you talk different? Do you dress different? Do you do things different? Do you act different? When your friends say this, do you say, no, not for me, and let them know? That would be peculiar. You know what's funny to me? Now listen to me. I've made this illustration before, and I'll say it again. I think it is funny that grown men can get all excited about a football game. I'm talking like professional NFL football. You know, they can get up there, and what's the Wisconsin team? Green Bay. Oh, there's, a, there's a non... Yep, yep, there's a... Pri- yep, you need to be an oddball, brother. But anyway, these guys, these guys... Let's say if Green Bay gets into the... Uh, what, what do they call that? The Super Bowl or something. See, I'm so oddball, I don't even know what that is. But anyway, Super Bowl. And, and, and they get out there, and it's five degrees below zero, shirt off, godly-looking bodies. Godly-looking bodies. And they'll paint the names of their team on their bare canvas bodies in five below degrees weather with cheese wedges on their heads yelling at the top of their lungs, and I'm a fanatic because I love the Lord. Isn't that weird? And I'm peculiar. But some of these folks will go to great lengths to do weird physical things for their teams. Now, I am not about saying that if you're a Christian, you ought not to like football or baseball or anything like that. Those are fine sports. They're wonderful, great. I'm bored to death by them. But nevertheless, if you like them, great. But what I'm saying is this. We as Christians, if you're a Christian and you go to church three times a week, you read this Bible, you live in a manner that is peculiar, you're looked at as a bit of an oddity. And you should be. It's the Christian who wants to be covert that concerns me. And there are all kinds of churches that are out there to placate that part of Christianity. The undercover Christian. The undercover brother. You know, the guy that, you know, I, I want to take this seriously, but I don't want to take it literally. I, 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 I like some things about Jesus' teaching, but some of the Christians bug me. I was, uh, there was a video posted uh, yesterday from a friend of mine. 
he was out street preaching. Not Brother Winchester, pastor friend of mine out, out in uh, Pastor Graves. And his folks like to go out to the corner of Rosecrans and, and Imperial, or Pioneer, Rosecrans and Pioneer right there, where the Norwalk Square is. And they get on each corner. There's a, it's five points right there. So they got someone on five corners of that thing. And they got, they got uh, uh, signs with Bible verses, and some guy's got a bullhorn. You say, that's weird. I know. But that's what they do. I'd rather them do that than not. You say, I don't do that. But thank God they do. All right, so don't sit there and say, that's weird. It's supposed to be. They're supposed to be odd. They're supposed to be peculiar. It's supposed to be out of the norm. So anyway, so, so they're out there doing that, and some supposed Christian came up to one of them and got up to their faces and say, you ought to be more loving, shouting. <laughs> shouting. <coughs> mean spirit. I should post it on our Facebook so you could see it. Post saying things were just... You ought to say that these, these kids out here, you know, they need love. They need to know their love, that Jesus loves them. And all, these, all the Liberty Baptist Church folks are just standing there listening to this guy. Of course, cell phone like this. But when you've got finished watching that, I don't know, minute and a half or whatever it was, you were left with the impression that the guy preaching about love was actually more hateful than the guys preaching on the corner. The impression I got. Now, am I, am I all about preaching on the corner? I'm, I don't do that. Not a big de- I'm not a big thing about that, but I got no problem with it. But what I think is funny is, is some guy saying, you're intolerant. When what he doesn't tolerate is what the guy's doing. These absolute weirdos don't even know what they're saying. It's amazing how these guys will say, well, you're not being tolerant. Well, isn't that the de- definition of intolerance? If you're saying we're being intolerant, intolerant of what? It's funny. Let me tell you what I'm supposed to do. Let me tell you what this preacher is supposed to do. Let me tell you what any preacher is supposed to do. According to that verse, chapter 2, verse 15, we're supposed to teach you this and rebuke you with it and exhort you, and let no man despise us because we do it. Because we have an authority. In fact, it says, do it with authority. Say, so how can a preacher just get up there and just start, because he's got authority? Not his own, but he's got an authority. Preacher this morning called this the believer's constitution. That's the authority. It's the authority. I say you live godly and righteously and soberly looking for that blessed hope in this present world. And I say that with authority and let none of you walk out of here despising me for it. In fact, you should walk out of here if I didn't say it with authority saying, why didn't he say it with authority? (coughs) Folks, There's a battle out there, and it's nasty, and there are a lot of Christian casualties. Don't plan on being a statistic. Be a saint. Amen. 